This is Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine. I have American history teacher Grady Miller with me in the studio. He joins me from Davidson Middle School in Hillsborough County. Grady, I know you are looking for lots of help on how to explain the constitutional amendment process to your students. So where would you like to start? Well, Dr. Fine, I appreciate your time. I'd like it if you could go ahead and tell me where exactly in the Constitution it explains the amendment process. You know, there are seven articles in the U.S. Constitution and the amendment process is number five. So that's very easy. One hand, one hand and you can amend the Constitution. Just It's amendment number five. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, you know, it's in interesting how there is sort of an a uh, legitimate order to the articles in the Constitution and so the fact that the way that it's changed sort of comes late on the list, right, it's five out of seven, sort of is indicative that the founders really wanted to sort of put in a really good infrastructure and then, but to recognize that the Constitution was a living document. And one indicator, and there are more mm -hmm. others found in other places, but one indicator that the Constitution was a living document is the fact that the Constitution can be amended. But they didn't put it so early in the process as to say, well, we think this is terrible, so change it at will. Instead, they sort of put it later on to sort of indicate that it was a living document and at the same time indicating that there needed to be a strong infrastructure upon which those amendments would sort mm -hmm. of work. Okay. Yeah. Great. Now, um, I can definitely understand how the legislature, the legislative branch would be would have a primary role as mm -hmm. far as this goes. Now, how do the other two branches work into this process? You know, with the amendment process, the founding fathers gave the states equal say in initiating the amendment process. It says in the Constitution that either uh, two-thirds of each House of Congress or three-fourths of the state legislatures or the conventions of those legislatures mm -hmm could initiate the process and then from there the other group would have to respond. But when we look over history, there have been 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. All 27 of those amendments have been actually initiated with the U.S. Congress and then the state legislatures have had to respond to that. So technically, the state legislatures can start the process, but in reality, none ever has when it came to an amendment that eventually ended up in the U.S. Constitution. Now, I could just sort of stop talking right now in terms of the other parts of your question, which is what role do the other branches play? And the answer is zero, 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 zero. But not really, right? You and I, wink, wink, we know, right? We know that when it comes to the role of the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court interprets what the Constitution means, including the amendments. Mm -hmm. So that even, in, even though an amendment is there because of this uh, interaction between the state legislatures and the U.S. Congress, we know that once an amendment is in there, then the Supreme Court interprets what it means. And that's the process that we call judicial review that was established in the 1803 U.S. Supreme Court case mm -hmm. of Marbury versus Madison. So the Supreme Court plays a role because they've said, you know, for example, they've given this idea of expression a voice. Mm -hmm. The First Amendment does not mention expression, and yet the Supreme Court has said that the, that the First Amendment includes symbolic speech and other forms of political expression. We know also that the U.S. Constitution or the Bill of Rights doesn't mention uh, a right to privacy and yet the Supreme Court has interpreted multiple amendments from the Bill of Rights to collectively be called a right to privacy. Now in terms of the executive branch's role, it's very confusing, Grady. If you have a presidential candidate, and I, I'm going back till I was you know, barely old enough to vote, which was a very long time ago, that presidential candidates have sort of made their stump speech and said, I support a blankety, blankety, blank amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And depending on who you're talking about, it could be a flag-burning amendment, and that was in the 1980s, a Victim's Bill of Rights, a Patient's Bill of Rights, a Balanced Budget Amendment, right, Human Life Amendment, you name it. 
presidential candidates will say, I support this kind of an amendment to the Constitution. And if I were not an informed voter, I would think, oh, he must get a vote. He must have a say. Mm -hmm. Technically, he doesn't. But where I see the concern is, is that people vote on the basis of the president's mm -hmm. viewpoint mm -hmm. because they don't know that the president gets no vote. So technically, I could be completely silent on the issue of the other branches, but we know through constitutional interpretation on the part of the um, judiciary branch and through the fact that the president has gone to Congress and asked them to vote on amendments to the Constitution mm -hmm. and that presidential candidates have said that that's what they support, we know that the executive branch has been involved in some way. Okay. Yeah. Now, you also mentioned how the states can initiate the mm -hmm. amendment process. Yes. Do they need to actually approve the amendments? And if so, how does that all work out? Well, the Constitution says that two-thirds of each House of Congress has to approve of any amendments to the Constitution and that three-fourths of the state legislatures must approve. Mm -hmm. Now, Amendment 5 is not very long, right? If you look at Article 1, it's much, much longer mm -hmm. than Article 5. So where is the silence and why is it important? The silence is that the Constitution doesn't say what it means for a state, an individual state legislature to approve of an amendment to the Constitution, mm -hmm. right? It's three-fourths of the collectivity mm -hmm. of the state legislatures, but it doesn't say that within any state legislature it needs to be 50% plus one, two-thirds, three-fourths, 60%. And what we've seen is, is that in some relatively recent, you know, relatively speaking, recent battles um, on amendments to the Constitution, what we found is, is that the fact that the state legislature decides for itself what its rules will be on voting on federal amendments to the Constitution, mm -hmm. that that's where some states might have passed it had it been a, a lower threshold. So, for example, um, in the 1970s, there was a big battle over something called the Equal Rights Amendment that was never ratified officially. And in the state of Illinois, um, the state of Illinois uh, was lobbied by anti-ERA groups to use a 60% threshold because they knew, looking at different members of the legislature, that if it was a 50% plus one threshold, then it would probably get ratified. Mm -hmm in Illinois, but if it was 60%, it wouldn't. Hmm. So it's not only what's in there, but also where the silences are that makes this process so interesting. Right. Yeah. Now, who are some key people and other important uh, vocabulary terms and such that students might need to know in relation to the amendment process? Well, you know, it's interesting because when we're talking about the amendment process, we're talking about this idea that even though the Constitution is a living document, the Founding Fathers also sort of didn't want things to just be changed at will, mm -hmm. okay, just changed at any time just because something didn't go right for someone. So even though, for example, there have been 10,000 amendments introduced either at the state or the federal level, Congress or the state legislatures, only 27 have been ratified. Mm -hmm. Of those 27, one of them reversed the other. And as I'm sure you talk about in your American history classes, the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. was ratified as a single group of amendments, all 10 of them in 1791. And that was really as a compromise position for the anti-federalists to vote on the new US Constitution. So if we look at the Bill of Rights as being sort of there as a bargaining chip for the anti-federalists, mm -hmm. and we look at the Prohibition Amendment from 1918 being reversed by the reversal, uh, you know, by the uh, anti-Prohibition Amendment, whatever you want to call it, in 1931 or 33, I think it was, um, then you're really talking about a net difference of 15 amendments since 1791, mm -hmm. okay? That's not a lot no. for over 200 years of, of effort. Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of those amendments, we have to understand that um, it's a very serious proposition, right, to do this. 
we also have to understand that the ratification process, and that's a good vocabulary word, mm -hmm. I, at least I think so, <laughs> the ratification process, which is like enactment of a law, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of, it's putting this agreement into place, traditionally has been a seven-year process. But with every amendment comes the statement of how long the ratification process can happen. And you might say, well, well, if it's been seven years as a tradition, why are you bringing this up? Because the last amendment to the current U.S. Constitution was written by the same person who wrote the first amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So an amendment that was ratified in 1791, an amendment that was ratified in 1992, were both written by the same person, James Madison. Right? James Madison, who was the fourth president of the United States, called the, you know, the founding father, right, big daddy, right, of the, <laughs> of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. the, um, he wrote the amendment that says that Congress cannot increase their own salaries. Mm -hmm. And it was ratified by Congress in 1789, but because three-fourths of the state legislatures had to vote on it and there was no ratification deadline, it took 203 years mm -hmm. until 1992 for that amendment to be ratified. So until there's another amendment right now, okay, we have this unique sort of situation where the first and the last amendment were both written by James Madison, uh, mm -hmm. one of the founding fathers mm -hmm. of the U.S. Constitution. Now when you're talking about sort of, you know, some good vocabulary terms and other kinds of things, um, what we also have to talk about is sort of you know, in light of the fact that this is a very serious process, um, why would there be some amendments and how do they sort of relate to the times? And what I want to talk about, Grady, in that regard is the word acting, mm -hmm. right? That when we're talking about the 25th Amendment, the 25th Amendment says that if the president is unable to carry out his duties of office, mm -hmm. the vice president becomes acting president. And of course you could say, well, I thought Article 2 says that if the president, you know, leaves office, dies or resigns, that the vice president becomes president. Why would you need an amendment? You know why, Grady? Because we live in a nuclear age, right? right. When President Harry S. Truman decided to use atomic bombs in warfare, it became abundantly clear at that point that there had to be a succession, mm -hmm. that we could never not have a president who was on duty at all times. So what that means is, is that if there is a period of time, it could be a minute, it could be a year. If there is a period of time when there is no person at the helm, mm -hmm. then we are then at risk of someone attacking us with nuclear right. uh, bombs. So consequently, the 25th Amendment was sort of considered after that. We said, well, why did it take from 1945 to 1967 if, the, if Harry Truman authorized in 1945 and then the 25th Amendment wasn't ratified until 1967? You know, what, is Congress slow? No, Congress isn't slow. It was just that it was sort of an idea, mm -hmm. but the idea really got percolated in the 1950s because um, President Eisenhower he suffered a major medical setback. He also hated President Nixon. And because President Eisenhower couldn't carry out his duties, what he did was he allocated his duties to, to other members of the cabinet and sort of, and he really wasn't back to work for over a month and those kinds of things. And it was really because he didn't like President Nixon. Mm -hmm. So it became clear that there had to be a succession, not just because of the idea of what happened with Truman, but because of the reality of what happened with Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it sort of took so long. And what this means is, is that when you're talking about that word acting president, that means that the president, as long as he's living, is still president. Mm -hmm. but it also means that the, there is someone in charge at all times. Right. And so, you know, I, hopefully I've had a chance to introduce you to some of those important vocabulary words such Definitely. as ratification and acting and um, those kinds of things to, uh, you know, to uh, bring this issue sort of to light into, an, into a current light.
In any case, Brady, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you about this process. We've been talking about the constitutional amendment process. That's Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine. Mm -hmm.